Welcome back, friend. I'm glad you've returned for another episode of Practical Stoicism. But before I start today, I wanted to give everyone a quick heads up. I'm going to start running an advertisement at the front of all future episodes. Now, I know how most people feel about ads because I know how I feel about ads. That is to say, I don't like them too much. And it's probably true that you don't like them too much either. But I would like to be able to get this podcast out to more people. And to be completely transparent, a 30 to 60 second ad at the front of every episode is worth about $25 for every thousand people who hear it. And there are 3,000 of you out there right now. So that's $75 an episode that I can roll into an advertising budget to grow the show. Essentially, it's a way for me to make the show more successful without having to ask any of you for the support to do so. For example, like if I were going to ask for donations or set up a Patreon. And in the long term, the more revenue I can generate for this show, the more time and effort I could put towards the project. There are more things I want to do than a weekly podcast for this project. For example, I have plans for a book and a few other things, but it all starts with being able to afford the time to dedicate to those other things. And that starts with being able to market the show a little bit to get it beyond just what I can reach organically. And lastly, I wanted to make a promise to you in concerns to these ads, I will never run one during an episode. I find that that sort of thing is hugely disruptive, and I feel that the work we're doing here is a little too important to be interrupted by an ad for a Keurig coffee maker or something. I've also worked with Megaphone, who's my hosting provider, to ensure that certain ad categories aren't allowed to appear in the ad before each episode. So, for example, ads for politicians. I respect that you give me some of your time every week, and I wanted to let you know that this change was coming before it happened, so you're not caught off guard. With that, let's hop into Meditation 12, which reads as follows. The speed with which all of them vanish, the objects of the world and the memory of time, and the real nature of the things our senses experience, especially those that entice us with pleasure or frighten us with pain or are loudly trumpeted by pride, to understand those things. How stupid, contemptible, grimy, decaying, and dead they are. That's what our intellectual powers are for. And to understand what those people really amount to, whose opinions and voices constitute fame, and what dying is. And that if you look at it in the abstract and break down your imaginary ideas of it by logical analysis, you realize that it's nothing but a process of nature, which only children can be afraid of. And not only a process of nature, but a necessary one. And how man grasps God, with what part of himself he does so, and how that part is conditioned when he does. In my opinion, where this first book is concerned anyway, and by the way, we only have five meditations left before we start book three, this is where things start to get interesting. The speed with which all of them vanish, the objects of the world, and the memory of time. The things we love will eventually be broken, and tossed into landfills, perhaps. The memories we have, and that others have of us, will eventually fade into obscurity, and no one will ever remember that fond memory we have about that one thing that was so important to us. And these things happen quickly. What is a hundred years, for example, let's say that's the average lifespan of a human being. What is a hundred years in the grand scheme of time? Science tells us that human beings have existed in their current homo sapien form for over 300,000 years. So a hundred years? How many times has that come and gone since our start? 3,000 times. And since every hundred-year period spans something like three to four generations, that means since we've been modern humans, there have been 9,000 to 12,000 individual generations which have come and gone. What do we remember of them? How eternal were their fears or their prideful things? Marcus might survive in his writing, but eventually he'll be gone too. After all, he lived 2,000 years ago. That was only 30 to 80 generations. Have you ever researched your family tree? If so, you know how true this is. Time gobbles up all things and eventually turns them into vapor, never to be recongealed into the things they were. To understand those things, how stupid, contemptible, grimy, decaying, and dead they are, that's what our intellectual powers are for. And to understand what those people really amount to, whose opinions and voices constitute fame, We've got to read between the lines here a little bit, I think, but what Marcus is saying is the first time we've seen him be truly morbid, I think. But that doesn't make him anything other than what we've learned a Stoic should be. Not morbid, but logical. Even if that logicalness seems morbid to some, sometimes, 
He's saying that famous people, those individuals who in our modern time, for example, take up so much of our attention, they all die. They wind up decaying bodies in a grave somewhere, and they wind up forgotten too, just like you, just like me. Their fame is temporal, superficial, and meaningless in the grand scheme of things. Why would we envy them? Why would we obsess over them? Why would we hold them up on any kind of pedestal? And what dying is, and that if you look at it in the abstract and break down your imaginary ideas of it by logical analysis, you realize that it is nothing but a process of nature, which only children can be afraid of, and not only a process of nature, but a necessary one. Now, I think it's worth mentioning here that these meditations, all of the ones that we've talked about so far in Book 2, in fact, all of the meditations in Book 2, are said to have been written while Marcus was engaged in a campaign against the Quadi. In fact, Book 2 is called Book 2, On the River Gran, Among the Quadi. The Quadi were a Germanic people who fought Rome in the Marcomannic Wars. And if that's true, death would have been not only on his mind, but also happening right before his very eyes on the battlefield. That means that these meditations aren't just thoughts that Marcus is writing down while lazed in a chair in his study at the end of a day of eating grapes and being an emperor. They are instead thoughts that he is writing down and which are helping him to psychologically navigate the reality which may have been surrounding him at the very moment he wrote them down. So to reduce your fear of death, and especially fear of your own death, down to an inevitability and a necessary process, I imagine this is quite useful in a situation where you might actually die, but also during times where you might waste time or place too much importance on what someone else thinks of you. In all of his writings, Marcus strikes me as having been a very practical kind of man, and maybe that's why we're starting practical stoicism with an exploration of the meditations. He's not writing these things down in a vacuum. He's applying the values of these meditations in the very life that is bookending them. And Meditation 12 closes with, And how man grasps God, and with what part of himself he does so, and how that part is conditioned when he does. Remember, Marcus thinks of God as being a rational universe, more so than he does of God or God's being individual beings. And he believes in it being a rational universe of which we are a part and from which we are constructed. You haven't heard this yet, but one of the Stoic principles is the idea that you cannot make something for which the necessary ingredients did not already exist. So in Stoicism, you will hear many Stoic philosophers justify the idea that the universe is logical with the argument that if it were not logical, how would it be possible for logic to exist? Where did the ingredients for logic come from if they don't exist in the natural world? Now, that'll be far down the line. We're not going to get into that in meditations, I don't think. But I did want to sneak it in there because it's an interesting thing to think about. I don't think Marcus is mocking anyone in this closing thought, nor do I think he is advocating for his conception of God. Instead, I think he's saying something more practical and obvious. I think he's saying, it matters how you choose to think of God because your intellect is affected greatly by that choice. If you grasp God wrongly or poorly, You'll spend your life differently, and perhaps not as well, than you would have if you grasped God differently or better. But also, maybe focusing on understanding God correctly helps you to view life more stoically, and you should keep that in mind when deciding how God, or the conceptual understanding of God, will fit into your life. So what's the practical takeaway from this one? I think it's this. It's all temporal. We all die. That makes us all equal in the end. And what matters most is that we understand this and use it to think more rationally about how we spend our time and our energy. Also, how important we aren't in the long term, and how this makes our behavior in the here and now all the more deserving of our focus and attention. And then finally, also, to be careful what we believe, because what we believe shapes us in ways we cannot recover from. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Practical Stoicism. If you haven't already, I would really love it if you would leave a review for this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or Podchaser.com. And again, as always, thank you for spending some of your week with me. I look forward to these Saturdays. I hope you do as well. And until next time, take care. Take care.